the reality is, is that the full architecture service is such a very small part of the market. Episode 157. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking with Jane Middlehurst, who is one of the founders of Home Notes, a learning platform that teaches and helps people navigate the often complex and stressful process of home renovation. So Jane is an architect and an RABA client advisor who set up Pulse and Middlehurst, an architectural practice in 2012. They specialize in residential architecture with, and she set that up with her co-founder, Amy Paulson. After they both became parents at the same time, they took a step back from their practice and set up Home Notes as a new venture where they are now using their experience as architects and practice owners to make the home renovation process less stressful, less risky, and much more enjoyable for homeowners. In this episode, Jane tells us the story behind Home Notes, how it started, the factors that compelled them to jump into this new venture, and how their desire to help clients through the process of home renovation developed into a full-blown learning platform. Jane also walks us through the client experience, why there's distrust in the process typically, and how Home Notes aims to fill in these gaps and promote a smoother and more positive experience for both the homeowner and the architect. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Jane Middlehurst. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Jane, welcome Hi. to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. Now, I've been really excited about speaking with you and what you've been doing and how your career has begin, uh, begun to unfold. Firstly, we were, we were contemporaries at the Bartlett back in, yeah. I think you would have been the year above me. Yeah, I think that's what we worked out. Yeah. Yeah, you were with with, with Rory Glynn and that kind of. Yes, that was my year. Excellent, excellent. Um, and after the Bartlett, you worked in a number of places. I know you were at CZWG for a while. Mm-hmm. How was that? That was amazing. I actually did my part one there um, and went back for summers in while I was studying um yeah an amazing experience a big practice um a fun practice um lots going on lots of experience yeah brilliant and then shortly after that experience you went on to found your own company Paulson Middlehurst in in January 2012 yeah so basically it was the um kind of the crash 2008 mm-hmm. um yeah. and I went away to build and uh, to do to work in an architecture practice over there for a few months, and when we came back, um, there were very few jobs, and there was not much happening in the architecture world, and so um, I carried on and did my part three, and decided to set up practice straight from part three. And did you do that completely alone? Uh, to set up practice. Yeah. Um, I. I had the idea to set up and then had kind of a, I think maybe a year or year and a half campaign of trying to get Amy, who was um, a friend of mine from university to join me. Um, and eventually she did, which was amazing. <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant. And and you still run Paulson Middlehurst at the moment? Yeah. Still, that still goes. So, so tell us a little bit about Home Notes then. Where did Home Notes come from and how does it relate to your your practice was it an offshoot of the practice mm-hmm. well it was it, it was yeah um it came from quite a few different things that kind of happened at once so um myself and amy were running the practice um i had already had some time out to have my first child and then me and amy ended up getting pregnant at the same time so we were both having children at the same time. We had a small practice. We had two people working for us. Uh, we had an office space and we just realized 
having been through the experience of having a baby and still managing projects, yeah. I just knew that it wasn't really sustainable for us both to be out at the same time whilst also trying to juggle those things. So we decided to essentially put the practice on ice. Uh, we stopped all our jobs. We closed the office um, and we had to take time out because that was, I mean, that was the choice that we made that we wanted to make. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so from that kind of space of both taking maternity leave and having a bit more room to think about what we were doing and assess where we were, I think we both realized that we wanted our jobs, but in a slightly different format that was going to be more, um, uh, go better with our kind of lifestyle now that we had children and we wanted to be a bit more flexible. Um, so that was where the root of kind of looking at where we were and kind of reimagining what it could be and what services we could offer in that space. Mm. That's where that came from. Uh, it's it's really interesting. I've, I've spoken to a lot of um, mothers who run their own architecture practice, and there is obviously the time constraints that a pra any practice kind of brings onto you, and how to balance that with with your family responsibilities and and family life that can be a, a puzzle at best. Yeah. Um, and that, and and for you just to kind of be able to totally put everything on on pause. Um, did that have any, you know, how did you deal with the clients? How did, how did it work from a business standpoint to be able to do that? It was really hard. I mean, winding down a business is really tricky because we yeah. had to stop taking on new clients. Um, and so yeah, those last, that last year, it, well, the, <laughs> the nine months that we knew that it was happening, then yeah, it was it was tricky and financially it was difficult because we couldn't take on any new clients. So obviously mm. we were working at less than optimum capacity. And then it turned out that some of our clients um, were happy to self-manage their projects on site. So a couple of our clients did that um, and we supported them, but we kind of helped them to do that themselves. Um, so I guess that's another leading on to the home notes thing, I guess that process kind of helped us for our, our future business ideas. What kind of work were you specialising in in Polson Middlehurst? Um, residential architecture. And um, so we started the business right from zero, uh, putting out requests to anybody that we knew that we were providing architectural services. So we really started at kind of very small scale renovations and extensions and we kind of ended up specializing in you know that lower end of the residential um mm. market um, and and that's where our whole business was i mean we enjoy it and we enjoyed the clients and i think we we really like the challenge of you know working to those tight budgets trying to kind of think of good ways to get people um the home that they wanted with the budget that they had um, so yeah, we kind of stayed in that market. And you're based in South London, right? Is it yeah. near Broccoli? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Nunhead. So yeah, very close okay. by. So, so there's there's quite a there's it's interesting actually. There's quite a uh, a good group of small um you know practices down there, all focusing on residential. You've got Graf there and is. Matthew Wood. Yeah, and, and it's surprising, isn't it? There's a there's a big group, um, but it's really nice because I think everybody is. Um, kind of come together to you know as a network to kind of improve their practices and, and help each other so that's really nice yeah great so when you were on maternity leave um this I'm presuming gave you a little bit of time to, to think to reconsider <laughs> yeah lots of time pushing a push chair around <laughs> with your mind like buzzing like what can we do what can we do um yeah, I mean, that was great. I mean, to have enforced walking time for so many months uh, with only your brain to kind of think of ideas, it's an amazing experience. I mean, it was for me. Um, and yeah, I think we came out of that feeling excited to try something slightly different. And and how, did, how was Home Notes born then? And what was the sort of the kind of an initial prototype for it or premise for it? Yeah, so I think we had already started to think of the concept of, you know, the idea that as working with residential clients 
and working on very tight budgets, we were coaching our clients a lot to do a lot of the process themselves. So some of our clients were doing party war notices themselves. Some of them, as I've just said, were you know starting to manage site themselves. And we felt like we were providing quite a big coaching service to them that was eating up a lot of the our budget, you know, so teaching them how to do the job was taking up a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Um, but And so we just got this idea that, you know, that would be so much more efficient. You know, it's the same for every single client. So we were already starting to make like client guides and information we could give to our clients to help them through. And then the idea kind of evolved that what if we were providing a service to like lots of people, we could Mm. we could help so many more people through this process if we kind of centralized our learning on like a central platform or did video lessons um, and that's where the idea for Home Notes came about as kind of a, basically a client advisory service, but for at the smaller residential market. Can, can you can you outline from your perspective some of the challenges that you face in that particular demographic of the market, both as an architect and both from a, a sort of client perspective? Because this is an interesting conversation where there's a lot of architects kind of um supporting that demographic or a kind of working there but it's still an underserved demographic and it's hard yeah like it's 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 no easy feat no. Why, why why is that do you think or what, what are some of the specific challenges that you that you saw or faced I think it's um it's a very chaotic place because in that market you've got um architects you know, design, what we would say, design-led architects that are providing like a full and detailed service that are straight out of architecture school or, or they're setting up practice for the first time and everybody has to start somewhere. So they start at the lower end of the market, but then, mm. you know, you realise that your clients can't, you know, that it's not, it's difficult to make a, a living out of that area because the fees just aren't big enough for the amount of service that you need to provide. So people tend to move through that market quite quickly and move up to the larger budgets because mm-hmm. they have to for to make a sustainable business. And then on the other hand, you've got architects that are providing a more minimal service, which is kind of obvious that you, you might only provide your clients with drawings up to planning. Um, you might not get, get involved with their interiors. Um, and so there's another service out there, but it's kind of partial and it's a bit more hands off. Yep. So the clients there are having to do a lot more of the work themselves, which is what we found and what we were helping our clients to do. And then there's obviously other players sort of like um, new kind of people coming into the industry, which are like, again, larger online companies that are providing a clearer pathway and a clearer system. But again, it is, uh, I would say it's, it's, it's efficient in its process. And so it's obviously less, you know, there's less support there for the clients. Yeah. And on top of that, like, not only have you got all those different options available to you, they all kind of sound the same. Like clients mm-hmm. often don't know that one service is different from another. Um, you know, they, they're getting a design, you know, they don't know whether that includes choosing all their products for them or whether it just means drawing their kind of foundations and you know outline construction details and then on top of that you kind of load in all the contractors that are in exactly the same position because they're working on very tight budgets at very small projects and they're juggling you know lot having to juggle lots of these projects at the same time it makes for quite a kind of a very uh, wide range of options for people Um, And yeah, on top of that, there's the design build companies that Mm -hmm. are doing, again, another service. So people are kind of a bit lost, really. Um, They might not know the best option to choose, or they might not realize what option they've even chosen until they're halfway through the process. So So I think, yeah, there's a lot of wayfinding to do in, in that area. It's, it's a very interesting part of the market, obviously, because it's in one sense, there's a huge amount of, you know, there's huge potential to scale. But as you as you said, with if you're providing a full architectural service and it's not uncommon that, you know, a lot of these projects, particularly for the younger practices, they'll take on a smaller um, rear extension type of project. And this is a this is going to be a showpiece. This is going to be the piece that they want to get into design. So there's a kind of a natural tendency to over deliver if you like for a not budget and then that becomes incredibly hard like you can't you just can't scale that kind of work 
and many yeah. architects are not happy doing the sort of lighter touch service then you're competing as you say with the with the bigger more slick operations that are coming in they've often got you know venture capital investment which is pumping you know and helping them kind of scale the market and then you've got your design and build company so yeah it's it's an incredibly fierce part yeah. of the market but also from a consumer perspective as you as you said it's like how can you t- how do we know what's what mm-hmm. how do we tell the how do we tell the difference yeah so 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 what do, so what is home notes then um how would you so describe home- it I guess we teach people how to manage a renovation project, mm-hmm. but you know that very. I think pre-hiring your team, like pre-architect, there's obviously as architects we know there's stage zero, which is the part of the project where you work out exactly what it is you want to do, how much budget you have, and then you kind of look around and see what services really meet what the type of project you want to make Mm -hmm. and I think you know primarily that's where we started is providing those that stage zero project assessment with people so that they could then select the right architect or approach the right people um because that there was nobody there to kind of help them through that process and once they were already with an architect you know maybe they maybe they're with the wrong person or maybe they then realize that what they want to do is slightly different so it's that pre kind of architect stage. But then we also take them on the whole journey because I think we we started out thinking we're, you know, from a design led architect background where we provide a full service. Yeah. So as we've learned more about the landscape of what's out there, we've kind of grown to understand the gaps in support that are there for um, so many people who have hired um, a more streamlined architect service. So we've developed our learning to continue to kind of help people fill in those gaps and know what those gaps are so that they can kind of oversee their own projects um, in light of not having that person that is their buddy that's there that, you know, we imagine the architect's going to take them through every step. That's not really the case for a lot of people. So we're, we're stepping in to provide education for all those stages right up until site and beyond. How did you how did you start? What were the first things that you actually did you did to take this from a good idea into something that was actually gonna happen or become implementable? What was the well, process that you went through? <laughs> um we actually started doing like physical workshops. So we put right. up like local ads for our local area and said we're gonna be doing this course in a cafe. Um and yeah, we we spoke to a room full of people and, and, and did workshops in, in that way. Um, yeah, so that's how we started out as a physical kind of workshop. And I think, to be honest with you, I mean, it felt a little bit like, you know, we moved on from that and we moved on to online classes and online mm-hmm. learning, like even pre-pandemic. So we were all set up, ready to go when the pandemic hit. And I often look back and think, oh, we wasted like that time kind of doing the physical ones. But I think in a way you have to because you can see real time feedback as into what you're saying, like what people understand, what they felt was missing. And you can read that from a room. So in a way, I don't regret that we started like that as our basis Mm. um, and then turned that into online so that we could kind of reach more people and it was more, you know, easier to access. When you first kind of started running the workshops, were you thinking we're going to have this as a as a business in and of itself or as a service in and of itself or were you thinking this might be able to be a like a a marketing funnel for our architecture practice if we want to yeah (laughs) wake that up again type of thing I think uh, we we have had quite a lot of people kind of I think architects message us and say oh this is such a great idea what a great funnel for your architects business and actually, like, it would be, and it is, people ask to work with us a lot through this, but that isn't where we're at. <laughs> you know, like, we can't, <laughs> like, in terms of capacity, we're, we're working pretty much full-time, making content, making, you know, it's it's a big undertaking, organising the platform and, and what we have to do. So mm. um, there isn't much time to do. We're trying to kind of, the practice isn't over, but it isn't that's not where our emphasis is right now like we don't have time to to be on site and that's not 
we still have young children and I think we decided that that wasn't where we wanted um how we wanted to work at, at this point so right now everything is is in the home notes uh arena we don't Amazing. use it as a funnel brilliant <laughs> and and so so after you started doing online classes and and things like that how are you how are you promoting it how were you getting the the reach in the first place to have people attend attend these sorts of things because that's no yeah. easy feat in itself no it's not um yeah we it's Instagram <laughs> in a word um I think we saw Instagram as a really good place to talk to people about renovation because there's just it's just such a visual thing um so we do um adverts and promotions on instagram and we've always, we've made like a big effort to build our following on instagram and um, we have a sales funnel um that runs from instagram into our mail list and then we talk to people about courses through through our mail list so at the moment that's how that's how it's working and so is it predominantly focused for people who are going to be doing a self-build or doing the majority of the work themselves and what kind of project managing something or you give advice on how to hire an architect and work with an architect. And, yeah, it's, and it's not, it's definitely not, I, I definitely feel like we're not in the self-build arena right now. I right. think that we were really kind of keen to make sure that our, our advice was specific to the, to the kind of process that we knew and understood, which is renovations and extensions. Um, I think a lot of it is applicable to self-build, but it's a, it's a tiny, it's a little bit of a, a niche market. Um, so we help people understand architects' fee proposals, for example, or right. do this job of discerning what the different services are that all these different people provide and why they might be different and what kind of architecture they produce. Because, you know, not every route is going to be right for every type of project that people want to create. And a really good example that you kind of spoke about earlier was, you know, quite often kind of young, ambitious architects who have want a portfolio piece, you know, that might be right for some clients, you know, they get a great, you know, they get a great, brilliant house for like, you know, and their architects put loads of effort into it and hasn't made much money on it. But actually, some people don't want that. And they yes. end up with this architect <laughs> where they're like, we don't want the crazy walls, or, you know, we just wanted some extra space, you know, and, you know, no, <laughs> there's no one route that's correct. Like it's those clients have to really sit down and ask themselves questions about what, what kind of project they want to create mm -hmm. um, and then choose the path that's going to deliver that for them. So, yeah, it's really about kind of helping the clients understand the process, but also understand themselves and, and what they want out of the project. Well, well, this is golden research, if you like, from a marketing perspective for those kind of practices that are serving that demographic because you're now interfacing very intimately with with the clients and understanding that actually, you know what, this isn't, this is not the right fit. This is the right fit. Here's the different pathway you could, you could go. How are you, how are the relationships that you're building with the profession and other practices? And do you have any kind of pushback from the profession of people sort of saying, hold on a minute, you're going to put us out of business or like, why are you giving away our secrets? This is what architects should be doing. Don't let clients learn themselves. Yeah. I mean, I was really, I mean, both myself and Amy were really conscious about that and kind of a little bit nervous, um, you know, from our contemporaries, you know, we are kind of sharing a lot of information which they would provide. Mm -hmm. I think the reality is, is that the, you know, the full architecture service is such a very small part of the market mm -hmm. and there are so so many people out there hashing together you know a project from you know all these other different ways that you know we've talked about that I feel it would be you know I don't think that we are we're impinging on that market at all yep. um in fact like you know even design-led architects have had clients that have been through our process and just said how much easier it is to work with a client an experienced client you know maybe they've not done a project before but they are very clear on their budget they're very clear on their brief you know they are knowledgeable about how the budget works together and the things you know we're teaching them how they can make the project efficient how they can work with architects well 
how they can work with their contracts as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're, we're del- you know we're putting good clients out there <laughs> into the world. So if we've if we've had someone through our course and and they're and they're suited to a design led experience, then we'll definitely push them down that path. So um, I hope that we're not treading on anyone's toes. And I, I think really the thing that was the biggest kind of maybe a surprise to the people our contemporaries is that architects in the in the wider world of renovation they don't have a good reputation and I think at this level in the market you can kind of see why because they're getting a very sporadic service people are getting very different experiences and it's not consistent and I think you know part of what we're doing is helping people have a better experience and a better yeah. view and understanding the value that architects can bring you mm-hmm. know and, and make that clear to everybody so that they can decide whether they want to pay for that service or or not um, but at the moment I think there's a little bit of mistrust in the architecture world um, and I hope we're, we're working to kind of dispel that so I'm hoping we're yeah, doing that- the that, that's that's a very interesting point that you bring up that that kind of yeah client mistrust and the mistrust that the rest of the construction industry has of architects and you know it seems like a bit of a, a mystery of what's happening and there is this massive variance in in services and in costs and like you were saying actually that a lot of the time in, and particularly in this particular demographic is that we have a lot of architects who are they have a full service offering and it's not a fit for a lot of clients Mm -hmm. it's not and they're not look it's not the right demographic altogether and we do get this situation where you've got um architects delivering a sort of showpiece when that's not what the client was after yeah and that can cause all sorts of communication problems it can also cause you know create fantastic projects don't get me don't get me wrong but it's it's also you know that there's there's a, a kind of lack of um, I don't know market awareness perhaps that's why what you're what you're saying that intimate relationship on the client side and actually starting to define what the market is is very interesting and then home notes is a is a service which is you're listening to the market and the service is evolving as a result of what the market is is looking for if you like and yeah, you start exactly. to so, so how do you actively work with architects and and do you work with um, or collaborate with any of these other kinds of companies that are like the dating agency apps for architects and clients? Um, oh, like putting people together? Yes, yeah. Um, I think at the moment our collaborations have been focused on delivering the information to clients. So like we collaborate with a party war surveyor so that they can explain the process and how notices work, you know, mm-hmm. so that our collaborations are about de- delivering the content to people so that they understand the process. Um, talking to, you know, quantity surveyors about how to understand construction budgets and tender process, you know, I think, you know, there is obviously um, collaborations that could be made with architects um, and, you know, and the kind of matching. I think, you know, there are services out there that do match people with um, architects. I think we're more interested in signpost- signposting people to these different services if they're applicable. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of, we're focusing on being um, impartial uh, and helpful um, and that's what people are paying us for is to give them the advice they need. And I think we can then send them on to, uh, we, we like to know about other services that are out there so that we can send people to the correct, to, for the thing that's going to be good for them. Mm. Do, you, do you ever white label your content or license your content so other architects can use it? Yeah, that was part of, you know, we did think about that um, as part of our business plan. You know, I still think it would be, a good idea um, I think we're still in the process of refining our content um, and yeah. we're you know like we're, we're always going back and like you know repeating and amending the content because we want it to be as succinct and as good as possible and I think you know once we get confident that we've got all of that base there then we could look at kind of white labeling it for other people because I know if I was an architect I that would be something like we said that you want your clients to know about um, how to do a particular process 
um, you don't want to have to tell them yourself and you could refer them. I think it's such a good idea and it's definitely something that we are keeping on the table. Yeah, it's, that's a potential sort of marketing um, goldmine there of, of, <laughs> of, of stuff. Because if, yeah, if you, if you think about it, I mean, you know, when I often speak with architects about marketing funnels, it's often around, well, how are you going to create client value for the clients? How are you going to educate them in the process? How can you actually kind of almost like what you've done, create a course or a program? But obviously, as you've, as you've illustrated, put, putting together that kind of content is no small task. Yeah. And for a small practice, it's, it's pretty labor intensive. So, and, 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 and I've had or spoken of architects before in the past who've actually used your stuff and they've directed clients and it's been worked very well. And yeah. also know a lot of, a lot of architects, well, most architects want to put their own name on something somewhere at some yes. point. Yeah. No, I'm like, very aware of that. Being, <laughs> <laughs> having run a practice myself, I would feel nervous about sending somebody off into like you're the primary source of advice and the trust has to remain between the two of you and sending them off into this other route where there is another person in the team kind of doesn't really fit and I can see how that doesn't really make sense I think that at right now the way that it works is if architects are receiving inquiries that are not kind of fit you know maybe the budget doesn't match with the brief you know they're not the right person for their practice mm -hmm. we want to be the person that they can refer to so that that client isn't just sent off into the ether because that's what I felt that we were doing in our practice with people saying we're not the right fit but oh you know what am I sending Good you luck. to you're just, you're just <laughs> sending you out there into nowhere so we'd like to be the person that can kind of receive those people and help them to you know to work out what it is and maybe even send them back to the same architect with a revised kind of budget and brief now that they know what they want to do and then at the very end the other end I think there are lots of practices that are not running stuff on site and they might be providing projects that you know, not every project is suitable for clients self project manage. And we mm. talk about that in the course. Um, but where projects are suitable, and the contractor and the architects agree that the client could take it on, which we basically prep people how to do that process um, themselves. So we we're a good bookend at the moment, but you're right, it would be nice for people to feel confident to kind of use all our um, content, you know, between those two things. Mm. Oh, it's, it's, it's really interesting. It's a really interesting business. There's so much like potential here. H how did you develop the, the business model for it and figure out how to start generating revenue and what are the sort of revenue streams that you've got at the moment for it? And what are the ones that you're looking at creating? Um, revenue streams are at the moment, you know, we've kind of, We've kind of, we have the content, we've been kind of working out the best way to package the content and sell the content. So we have, we started out with courses, then we went to a totally a membership model where there was everything in there right. and you, you know, you pay a monthly subscription. And now we've kind of got a combination because we feel like um, it's easier to kind of explain to people what they need in a course. So, uh, you know, our uh, getting started courses at the very beginning mm -hmm. so that's a packaged kind of bit of content then people can carry on through the membership um, and then there's a course at the end for which is site survival which is this um, site project management course so at the moment we've got a mixture you know I think we're just kind of we're adjusting it as we learn more about how people want to kind of use the content so we're still being quite flexible about that and monetizing that is obviously people pay for the course and they pay for the subscription and um, we have, you know, thought about, you know, um, sponsored content or, yeah. you know, links to other things. And I think, again, we're just really interested to build our base of knowledge and customers and get that kind of settled before thinking how we could interact with other people, just because I feel very conscious that I don't want our, um, our users to feel that they've been, we're an advice service. I don't want them to feel that we've been kind of we're giving advice based on sponsors or people that we're connected with so I think we want to work out ourselves who the right people would be mm. to kind of add another revenue stream in there how how did you guys uh, and, and you and, and Amy's the other co-founder with you on on mm -hmm. this how, how did how did you guys um learn about this sort of business was this something that you did you 
seek outside business advice or work with any other consultants or do any of your own training? Or is it this the, the sort of ruthless Bartlett, go and figure it out? Kind of? <laughs> <laughs> a bit. I think it was just like, this is a great idea. We're just going to give it a go. You know, like, yeah, I, I, I think we both felt so compelled by the need for this that it felt really easy to just think there will be a way you know there's there's a need for this and there will be a way of kind of working it out and 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 kind of setting it out to people the courses is kind of like starting with an in-person course seemed I guess that's where our thoughts went straight away as you're teaching mm. people get them in a room and do kind of a, a workshop type thing I think the membership idea um I think I came across a company that was doing a membership um, and was teaching the membership model. So I actually, I joined that membership to learn about how to make memberships. Ah, very, um, very clever. And so, and, and it was really good. It, it was kind of, you know, it teaches you about, I guess I didn't know anything about marketing. Yeah. Um, and we basically had to learn all of this from scratch, including how to build a platform, um, how to piece all the tech together. And um, so um, I, I had this membership that I was in that was teaching me how to kind of do what they'd done. So I, that's where I got a lot of the membership knowledge from. Um, and then the tech, we kind of spoke to a few different people to kind of work out how to piece together our tech that we were going to do. But in the end, we ended up kind of doing doing a lot of the, basically had to learn it yourself to know what you want it to be. So we've done, a, there's been a lot of learning. I have to say. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Um, yeah. And how, how um, has it changed your lifestyle in terms of now you've pretty much got an a hundred percent online business. Uh, yeah. And that comes with a lot of wonderful freedoms, yeah. which architecture practices don't always get to enjoy. Yeah. Um, how, how has it kind of, and particularly with motherhood, how has this type of business, how does the business model work for your lifestyle um like really really good <laughs> basically um amy actually uh, relocated to the czech republic um, oh wow so she's now in the czech republic i'm in london and um, we have a freelancer that works for us who we love um who works in france so we kind of we all come together on zoom um for our meetings um and we work different schedules, different timetables. So we mm -hmm. might only have kind of a, a two hour overlap in our days and every day is different. It just means flexibility. It just means that we can push work around uh, what we want to do. We sometimes work in the evenings. We do live calls with our membership in the evenings. So yeah, it's just, it's flexibility. Brilliant. And, and yeah. I, I suppose this opens up to a, a kind of wider question about the architecture industry and the difficulties with being a young mother mm -hmm. and running a practice or even working as, as an architect, what were you finding some of the real challenges running practice and being a mother? Um, I if think, any. I uh, think the brain, I think the brain space, I think, um, I'm a person who gets very, very involved in my clients' projects. So right. I'm going to bed at night, waking up, wondering if this is, you know, this is done, this is done. And I think once you're, you know, once you've got a lot going on at home at the same time, those, all of that information and all of that kind of um, can, can become kind of too much, I would say. Mm -hmm. For me personally, it was. I think what I did, like before, you know, as we were making the transition, from our practice we were still running projects in our practice to fund set, the setting up of home notes right so as we were doing that i kind of set up a kind of we'd already gone online and we were doing projects online so we had like a, a portal an online process which we followed with our clients and i think that kind of like basically a pro, an online project management system which really helped me kind of put all of those things systemize all of those things so it wasn't so much in my head mm -hmm. um so i think there's an, a there's a place for kind of online management that can make small small practice easier and i think if i ever re, you know return to doing projects 
again um that's that's what i would want to be doing is kind of systemizing a lot more stuff Mm. and and not holding so much information in your head about projects well it's quite an interesting experience now you've you're running a a digital online business how that would influence the way that you look at running an architecture practice and the poss and the possibilities because you quickly start to recognize that we know the online world there's so many incredible tools that could be used and remote working really is not that crazy an idea and no I mean we did I mean that's the other thing is that I guess because of having kids and having clients that wanted evening meetings we ended up doing all of the all of the detailed design meetings online in the evenings and it's great and there's so many amazing tools out there that you can kind of pull products in be having discussions like sharing links you know, for me, that is, you know, better than doing an in-person meeting because I feel that you've got so much more at your fingertips that you can discuss with them. Um, so, yeah, I think it's there's, there's a lot of stuff we can learn from the online world. And I think also in terms of web development is a creative process mm-hmm. and the process that we've been to to kind of make our platform and go through all of that. I've learned such a lot about how they just even like slightly different terms or slightly different ways of thinking about creative design and how you take a person through that process. There's such a lot that could be learned, you know, when you take another profession and overlay it onto, you know, architecture. I think there's a, there's so much mileage in learning from that and, and using those process in architecture as well. Absolutely. Um, in terms of home notes, um, what are your plans for for scaling the operation and, and how are you doing it? Have you accepted or are you, are you looking for funding or investment or any? Has there been any outside investment yet or that's not something you want to go down that path just yet? Or We haven't had outside investment. We had a couple of talks with a few people. Um, I think I think we were both nervous of wanting to remain not being under pressure to scale the business too quickly Mm -hmm. I think we are in a really amazing position right now that we have the flexibility and the freedom to do you know whatever we want whatever is going to work best business Um, and I think there's I think there could be a point where we would want investment but I think right now we're we're so um we're so interested in kind of optimizing what we have and the way that we work and creating all this content and making sure that it's the best before, you know, I I didn't really like the idea that you press, you get the investment and then it's this kind of race to return the investment basically. Mm -hmm. And that kind of worried me slightly. So I think there might be a stage that we get to that that would make sense. But right now we're, we're still kind of, you know, making the business the, the best it can be before we want we'll before scaling it before it's mm-hmm. ready. If if you were to look for investors, what sorts of what sorts of person would make the ideal investor for you? <laughs> um, I think there are there are venture um, kind of providers out there that are you know looking for ethical. Um, and work with female teams you know I I would be looking for something a little bit more um, alternative perhaps than the you know traditional investment it would be important to me where that money came from and and how it was delivered I think Mm -hmm. that yeah I'd be very tentative about what investment we got in the company yeah I'm I'm just I'm just thinking these things uh, again it's very interesting just as from like from an architectural owner perspective you know, other sort of practices maybe that are quite mature and have got investment funds, like that could be something that would work well in terms of, you know, be quite synergistic um, and having having investors that understood or knew the construction industry as well. It's, yes. it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, yeah, there's, I could see a lot of people being very interested in, in, in that. And of, and of course, you know, who those pers- people are, it's not just the money, it's the, mm-hmm. it's the expertise and the connections and, yeah. and and their ability to be able to bring value to home notes as well if you if you chose to to grow it in that manner yeah i think it is quite a hard world to <laughs> to you know over the years i've kind of you know done quite a lot of research into the ty- the types of investment you can get and i think mm-hmm. in a way what i would want would be home notes for 
investment. You know, I want somebody to kind of, <laughs> you know, it, it feels as though it's all a little bit behind the curtain and mm -hmm. it's who you know. And, and I feel like there could be a, a, an easier way in for people that don't necessarily know about that word or, or have those connections. Because like you say, it's about finding the right person. Um, and again, that's a bit like a, a dating scenario, isn't it? That you want to find the right fit. Um, so yeah, if anybody knows of that company, then I would be interested <laughs> to know about it. Love it. I love it. And so are your clients typically there nationwide? Have you had anybody outside of the UK? Um, oh, not outside of the UK yet. Um, but, but yeah, all over the UK, which is great. And I, I love hearing about um, yeah, the different experiences people are having in different parts of the country um, and come to us with their queries and, you know, reviewing people they've spoke to and the, the kind of obstacles they come up against. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, and I, and I guess it's not it's not crazy to think that this would be a relatively easy, I, in, a, in a way, to be able to expand beyond UK shores. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think the process... Um, is very um, applicable, you know, all over the world. Um, I guess you just need to kind of perhaps uh, scale back some of the more, you know, object UK specific stuff about the building control. And, but the, the majority of what you're learning is actually is about the client and about their process, really. So that is very, very, um, it, it's useful for everybody, isn't it? Brilliant, brilliant. And so what, what are the goals for 2022? Um, I think just getting the word out there. I think we are, we've spent so much time making our content and, you know, the information that goes inside the, the, the platform that now we just want to like talk about it, which is, you know, why I'm here. And hopefully I can do more of this for the next year and really tell people what we're about and, and what we're doing. Yeah. Brilliant. And if there are any architects listening, they want to get in touch because they want to send some of their clients your way what's the best way for them to do that yeah um just use our email address hello at homenotes.co and contact us um or go and have a look on the website if they want to refer people directly excellent i shall put all that in the show notes jane thank you so much that's the perfect place to conclude that's been really really insightful and just so exciting to hear of of your of your business and what you're doing it's it's brilliant really great thank you for having me it's been really enjoyable and that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.